So I've been asked to address this following statement. It seems as if education tends to sometimes reinvent what has already been invented as different approaches come in and out of fashion. In the late 50s, the Russians launched Sputnik and our country turned on a dime and passed a number of initiatives to fund research and development in science and technology over the next decade. During the 90s, it was widely hypothesized that technology was going to save education and millions, maybe billions, were spent wiring our schools. Nowadays, we seem fairly preoccupied with passing standardized tests. No child left behind is on the thoughts of everyone. While we preoccupy ourselves with math, reading, and language arts because they are tested, what is happening to other areas of the curriculum? Are we setting ourselves up again for a science-deficient nation in the future? What is going on in, back at your ranch? Has your curriculum changed over the last six years? Are kids be smarter because of NCLB? Are we creating thinkers and problem solvers or just good Jeopardy contestants? So to answer this, I'm actually going to take you on a journey of what I've been doing this Thanksgiving Day. What I found on the internet were, as I tend to do, two online live events this day. And the first one, which is I'm in the middle of, the last keynote's coming up, is the Australian World's Workshop. And here is the Second Life Conference. Note cards that talk about the conference presentations and speakers. I've been going to them all afternoon. So my beliefs, my student constructivist belief, my hands-on project-based learning beliefs have not changed, but being able to use such immersive technologies both in my professional development and for my students is what ha has been what's changed. So for the next several minutes I'm just going to show you what some of the best thinkers and this is just a few hours experience in the online environment again with the Australian Virtual Worlds Conference and then another one that was a live Ustream called Awakening Possibilities and it is about the students and it is giving them the skills but it first of all we need to do so as the teachers as the educators of those students. Thursday night as I said yeah. uh, Thanksgiving I'm attending this Australian conference with so people from all over the and world I, I talked to her on Friday. in a virtual reality you look good lab in and having oh, a but you want to use that chat with one of the participants about developing oh. standards oh. in oh. virtual worlds and what skills oh. kids need oh. what's oh. exciting oh. is okay. here yeah. it is Thursday night, Thanksgiving, and I'm involved, I'm involved in an activity that I want to do, a, a rich, immersive learning environment, my choice, it's, as are all these other people or avatars, and that's the same environment, some of the environments that we need to offer our students, choice, rich, immersive environments. Uh, so... This is very much linked to a classroom environment locally and sharing on an international stage. Okay, so in order to do that, in order to do that, we have created uh, access to online units that everybody can get to that are based around curriculum so that, again, you can work on an online unit, get into an on online unit that might look something like that one. This one's real gorgeous, a unit uh, by our PE staff, and it looks at body image. So they would study body image at school, in their various schools around the planet. And when they come across um, an aspect of that unit that would be better done in a virtual world, then they'll go into the virtual world to do it. They won't do the entire unit in the virtual world. So in this case, they would go to their various media outlets and, and, and look at uh, how does body, how does uh, media influence body image, etc. And then eventually they would organise an event where they would go in-world and uh, the Australian kids would compare, their, they would dress their avatar as the perfect body image and they would then compare that against what New Zealanders thought was the perfect body image or Japanese kids, is there a difference and why? And uh, they get the direct comparison. Because what we think is very important, uh, obviously, in this world is understanding other cultures as the world's changing. And there's no better way to understand other cultures than to actually talk to the kids. 
and that's what the kids are doing. So th there's lots of things going on, as uh, we said earlier. Uh, so too many things to keep hold of, but what we're seeing in all sorts of ways is these global collaborations and understanding of an authentic nature because they're talking to each other. Uh, we give them a framework to talk about education, but they talk about a lot of a much more motivational if they can go in, experience some virtual type aspect, they get inspired and come back and they write about it. And we're getting uh, pretty good products out of that. Learning activities that I believe students should be engaged in. Choice. Yeah, so being, being more we got to get you in with Skype here. So if you could uh, visual, find me on Skype, that would auditory, be great. Social collaboration. I mean, they're talking to each other. Am I under that? Uh, it's a pretty amazing and rich learning environment. That, so I need to, dump my to address the original that. question, uh, it doesn't matter. You you just do the uh, paper and pencil tests, bring out of paper textbooks. We're just not preparing the students for the skills they're going to need in everyday life and in the for the first time in recent memory, kids aren't watching TV when they go home. Uh, Clarence posted about it on his blog, and I did a straw poll in my room, and almost no kids are watching TV. Um, they're doing this. Um, they're sitting on Facebook all night. Um, they're playing Halo, World of Warcraft, and frankly, TV is just nothing that interests them anymore. Uh, apparently, Fox TV is not going to have cartoons on Saturday morning anymore. It's all going to be infomercials. But yet we still teach as if this is our classroom, with the kids sitting in rows and looking all attentive at their little wooden desks. And we make them want to work this way. And I, I don't think that they want to anymore. Regular homework. Here, take your pen, take your paper. It, it just, they don't feel inspired to do what needs to be done for them to intuitively want to learn. Okay. Inquiry process. Set the kids up, set them free, and just let them go out and have fun. They will do what they need to do. You don't need to do this. They want an audience. The world is at your fingertips. You look in the room tonight, you've got people from Australia, the States, all over the States. Can you imagine what a kid would do if you knew the people in Australia are reading what he writes? Just, just to see the inspiration right there. The audience sells. Kids do stuff when people are reading their work. Don't do something where just the school or the city does something. Read it. See it. Set it up so the world has an opportunity to see what your kids do. And now your classroom looks like this. Oh. Uh, hey, I updated it. You got it. <laughs> right? This is what your classroom looks like. It can still be in rows, but these kids now have the tools at their fingertips to do something creative. Okay? And I want that iPhone for us. A professional development. Uh, for me, it's just like the sign says, it's about innovation, invention, and insight. I believe that as a teacher, I need to know these skills and embrace them and love them and spending my holiday Thanksgiving learning about all of this very exciting and immersive and participatory technologies, ones that cannot be avoided in the schools. I don't believe that the school system prepared me for real life, but I survived and I think now, given the gap of what's going on in students' home lives and what's going on in the school lives is bigger than it's ever been and I don't think our students will survive. I have fifth graders who don't even know how to save a Word document, so I have to be teaching them these skills. It's just not a choice. There's an ethical obligation we have to our students to make sure that we aren't just servicing state mandates, but we're serving the stu best interests of the students because that's what it, the founders of education designed it for, is to serve the best interests of the students. John Dewey and Mann and Montessori. Um, we need to practice for the students and not for any state mandates.